Good morning. Welcome to this beautiful weather day. We're due. Are we due? Yes, we're due. Uh, glad that you're here today. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of James chapter 2. We're in the middle of a series, Let's Go Month, and the series entitled When Faith Works. It goes. So if you could take your Bible or your device and get ready for James chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter. It will not be on the screen. And so if you could prepare, that would be wonderful. Let's do a little history lesson. When the communists took over Russia in 1917, they vigorously persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. The Constitution, written in 1918, one year later, in fact, guaranteed a freedom of religion. But the communists did not make it illegal to worship Jesus. However, they did make it illegal for the church to do any good works. It was illegal for the church to do good deeds. No feeding the hungry. No educating the poor, no educating the young, no housing the orphan, no caring for the sick or feeding the hungry. The new communist state would now handle all of those duties. And what happened? Within 70 years, the church in in Russia was largely irrelevant to the communities around them. You take away service. You take away ministry, and you take away the church's power, influence, and evangelistic effectiveness. The power of the gospel is combining is this life-changing message with selfless service. We might say we need a bold proclamation of the gospel, but we also need a compassionate demonstration of the gospel. Jesus taught us this in the Book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 19. Luke writes, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before all the people. Many times as Christians, we get these out of balance or swing on a pendulum to one side or the other. They're part of the same coin, two sides of it. So I'm going to read James chapter 2. James both teaches us, instructs us, encourages us, but James also has this ability to punch us in the gut. And this is one of those chapters. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And a poor man in shabby clothing also also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over here or you sit down at my feet. Oh my, can you imagine? Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name, Jesus, by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is clothed, poorly clothed, and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And then James gives two examples, one about Abraham and one about Rahab the prostitute, and he closes in verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Wow, there's our punch. For us to move into this and understand the context of which James is writing all that, many times the New Testament uh, believers knew exactly the, the, the uh, references and the context of what the writers were saying. And, and many times, 2,000 years later, we miss it. So I want to give just a couple uh, examples of what James is talking about to try to build a context as we discuss this message today. First of all, James says and references Jesus speaking in Luke 6 when he says the poor will inherit the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now, when they heard this understanding or this idea or this phrase, the kingdom of God, they knew exactly what it meant. But somehow we don't always know what the kingdom of God is or what the kingdom of heaven is. Matter of fact, if I were to say, would everybody take a pen and paper and write down your definition of the kingdom of God, we would probably have as many definitions as we have people here. So the first thing that we need to do is we understand faith and works is we need to understand that we need to embrace the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. So every day that I wake up, my first thought should be the kingdom of God. My last thought before I go to sleep at night should be the kingdom of God. The way that I maneuver and live and leverage my life as I live it on a daily basis should be focused upon the kingdom of God. But the question is, what is the kingdom of God? Well, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we get an understanding of what the kingdom is. We have a garden, and we have the new heaven and the new earth. But then sin comes into the the world, curses and breaks the world, and Jesus comes in the middle of this and sets up his kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this world. And he begins to unveil what this kingdom looks like. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist says, repent, his message, very simply, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew 4, verse 17. The very first sermon Jesus preaches, again, is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he goes on as he begins to send out and go out in 423. And he went throughout all of Galilee, proclaiming what? The gospel of the kingdom. Then he begins the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 6, 9 and 10, he teaches us how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he comes to the verse, same chapter, verse 33. So now understand this. Seek first Make it the priority of your life. Elevate it to the prominence it deserves. Seek first the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected from the dead. He has 40 days left on this earth before he ascends into heaven. Everything you say in these last 40 days is probably the most important thing 
that he would probably teach or has taught to this point. What was he teaching? Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Paul picks this up. The end, last chapter of the book of Acts, Paul's in a house of arrest kind of thing, and people are coming, and from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God. The last two verses in the book of Acts, Paul was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. There are over 150 references to the kingdom in the New Testament. And for many of us, we never really think about the kingdom. We don't understand our role in the kingdom. We don't see ourselves as kingdom citizens giving allegiance to a king in the midst of his kingdom. So how do we understand it? What does it mean? Well, the kingdom of God in its simplest form is understanding that it is what the world looks like when King Jesus gets his way. Life as it was meant to be, or as we might say, life as God meant it to be. It was a garden in Genesis 1 and 2. It's the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22 and for the rest of eternity. But we live between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20. We live in what is called Middle Earth. You can think about that. And Jesus comes, the king, to set it up, and he begins to do things and model what the kingdom looks like for his three and a half years of ministry. And look at the things that he does. He deals with the lack of, 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 of painful, broken issues that are here to redeem them. Why? Because there's no poverty in the kingdom. There's no orphans. There are no widows. There's no sin. There's no curse. There's no divorce. There's no addiction. There is no death. There are no demons, no disease, no temptation, no sickness. So Jesus casts these things out. He modeled that these things are not part of the kingdom. Praise God, they're not part of the new heaven and the new earth. They were not part of paradise in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So the kingdom is life as God intended it to be. And then he gives us, let this be your priority. Seek kingdom life first. I'm praying for you, kingdom citizens. I'm praying, my servants. I'm praying that you would engage and make your life priority to bring heaven to earth, in a sense to bring kingdom to earth. Eliminate the things that aren't kingdom life. You see, the kingdom is not just a big deal. The kingdom is the deal. So when we go about helping to alleviate poverty, helping children get an education, caring for the sick and the poor, and helping humans flourish, we are about kingdom living. Even those who don't know Christ to teach the lost how to know their father who created them. We're bringing about the kingdom as God meant it to be. And so James says, if you're showing partiality, to people of influence and power and wealth, and you're ignoring the poor who Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and they have a faith that those who have wealth don't understand. You are dishonoring a fellow image bearer of God. How could this be? Let this not be so. We are told to love our neighbor in verse 8. Not just our Christian neighbor, but all neighbors. When you show partiality or you prejudge or you have prejudice, you dishonor the poor. You dishonor your neighbor. Showing partiality, James says, and it's amazing that he uses these two uh, references from the Old Testament, you <laughs> Showing partiality, he says, is like the sin of adultery and the sin of murder. 
What? Yeah, isn't it amazing when you ask people, you know, are you a Christian? Well, I, you know, I, you go to church, I go to church, but I'm not perfect. I mean, no, I've not killed anyone. We like that one, right? I've not killed anyone. I don't commit adultery, but, you know, I, I, I'm all right. It's always amazing how we take what we consider the, the highest sin, the worst sins in the world, and somehow feel justified if I'm not committing them. Well, I mean, I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm not a murderer, crying out loud. And this is one of James's punches. You walk around and say, I'm not, I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not horrible either. I mean, I don't kill people. James says, when you show partiality, when you prejudge and show prejudice, and you elevate yourself or elevate other people based on external circumstances, you're a murderer and adulterer. You see, when you commit a sin, you're in the what? The sin bucket. And he puts this to a punch to them. Don't you know that sucking up to the popular people and rich people and people who can do something for you and ignoring the poor and the orphan and the widow and the undocumented foreigner is the same as committing adultery and murder? You're looking at a fellow image bearer, lost or saved, a fellow image bearer, and you're determining if they have vowed you. Not possible. In Matthew 25, Jesus, in one of his last teachings, talks about when the king returns and sets up his kingdom, he will separate the sheep and the goats. And he'll move those who are righteous and followers of his, the king, and he'll separate those who have rejected him as king. And this is his criteria. The righteous said, how did we become righteous? And Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, when did we see you like this? And Jesus said, as much as you did these things to the least of these, you did it to me. And the goat said, when did we see you hungry and not feed you? And when did we see you thirsty and not give you something to drink? And Jesus said, when you didn't feed the poor and give something to drink to the thirsty and visit the prisoner and clothe the naked, you didn't do it to me. And he cast them out. Something fascinating happens in this understanding. Jesus identifies himself with the poor. Many times as, as, as Christians, we think, hey, we're going to take Jesus here. We're going to take Jesus to Africa. No, no, no. You're not taking Jesus to Africa. Jesus is already there. He's simply inviting us to join him in what he's already doing. See, we're taking, we're going to the Take Jesus to the prisons. You're not taking Jesus to the prisons. Jesus is there. Or to the hungry or to the poor. Matter of fact, Jesus identifies with these people. When you feed the hungry, Jesus says, you're feeding me. When you visit a prisoner, you're visiting me. Some of you think, I don't know Jesus very well, and I'd love to grow and get to know him better. Go visit someone in prisoner. Prison, you might just meet him. Go feed the hungry. Care for the broken, the orphan, the widow. You might have a great chance of seeing Jesus. It's a very interesting, interesting thing. So James says, let me just tell you something. When you show partiality and give favor to the influencers, the wealthy, those who have power, 
and you dishonor the poor, you're dishonoring Jesus. That's who he identifies with. What? Engage the kingdom. Engage the kingdom. Part of the kingdom is the poor. How do we understand what James is talking about? We need to empower the poor. He talks about preferential treatment in in the beginning part of chapter 2. He talks about loving your neighbor in verse 8. He talks later about the poor. And then he talks about those who are poorly clothed or are hungry. What do we do with the poor? It's always a big conversation in our nation, our country, even in our churches. But the question is, who are the poor? How do I know if I see one? Because our definition of poverty will determine everything. For many of us, Americans' definition of poverty is the lack of resources because we love resources. But your definition and America's definition of poverty, majority of that, is not the same as biblical poverty. Perhaps the most important part in caring for the poor is making space in our life for them is to understand the definition of poverty. What is James talking about? You see, so many religious folks like to judge the poor. They're lazy. They make poor choices, and and we criticize them. But the definition is everything, and whatever we define as poverty is what our solution will try to resolve. For instance, if you think poverty is a lack of knowledge, you will try to educate the poor. If you think it's oppression by powerful people and systems, you will try to work for social justice. If you think it's personal sinful choices, you will try to evangelize and disciple the poor. If you think it's a lack of material resources, you will give them money and material stuff. And we see this all in our country as politicians and leaders and even churches fumble through this poverty alleviation question. As a matter of fact, we know if you give people stuff, many times it hurts and disempowers them. It doesn't empower them. You see, there are multiple reasons people are poor. They're very diverse and and variegated. There, There are certainly broken individuals and come from broken places and broken families. And and they have certainly have people who make unwise choices. And there are certainly oppressive systems, economic, religious, social, and political systems. There are natural disasters that wipe out resources around the world and keep people in poverty. There's sickness that brings poverty. There are demonic forces that are very active that continue to try to keep people in hopelessness and poverty. But you see, Jesus in the Bible has answers for all of these. It doesn't matter what the purpose or the cause or the, 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 the reason for poverty, the Bible and Jesus have the answer. I hope you believe that. As a matter of fact, I would say that the church of Jesus Christ is the only one who is prepared to handle this issue. But we must understand that poverty is much more complex and we cannot appropriately care unless we understand what pro- poverty is. Diagnosis is important. If you go to the doctor with a brain tumor, cancer, and you say, Doc, I have a headache, and he says, Take two Tylenol, you are not going to be helped. The diagnosis was missed. And sometimes we do more harm when we try to help the poor because we don't know truly how to care for poverty in a biblical perspective. And we end up disempowering people and robbing them of their image-bearing status. So I want to give you a biblical, what I believe is a biblical definition of poverty. It comes from the Chalmers Center a uh, great organization out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. 
Truly, poverty is the inability to fully experience image bearing. Created in the image of God, every human, the inability to fully experience image bearing in the four key fundamental relationships of life our relationship with God, our relationship with ourself, and our relationship with other people, and our relationship with creation as a whole. They are not working in the way God designed them to work. They are not experiencing the kingdom life. They are not experiencing the abundant life. We have another kingdom. It's not led by a king. It's led by a prince, an evil prince, who's trying to rob people and make them hopeless and keep them stuck in never experiencing the full abundant life that the king promises to his people. And these folks are not experiencing that abundance. They're not experiencing life as God meant it to be. Human flourishing is not happening there. Poverty is there. There are no schools. There are no good schools. There are, there, there, there are not enough jobs. There's not enough food. Uh, there's abuse. There's sex trafficking. There are issues around. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not life as God intended it to be. And these are the four major relationships, God, self, others, and creation. And the materially poor may see themselves unworthy of God. He doesn't know me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't know my name. The materially wealthy may have a broken relationship with God just simply believing he doesn't exist. Even with self, the materially poor may fall into shame and and unworthiness and I don't matter. And those who are materially wealthy may have a broken relationship with their self in thinking that they are God. Arrogance and pride. And this goes right down the line. From a biblical standpoint, all of this happened in Genesis 3. Instead of being in perfect relationship with God, they're hiding in the bushes from their creator father. Rather than being naked and having no shame, they're covered up with fig leaves full of shame. The peaceful relationships with others have turned into conflict to where the next chapter four, Cain kills Abel. And the brokenness in all of creation, you're going to plant seeds for food. But I want you to know, Adam, what's going to grow are thorns and thistles. And Jesus affirms this, in this life you will have trouble. The broken relationships and the four key fundamental relationships of life, poverty. And you see, when I understand this, then I realize that there's no us and them. We all are in the poverty bucket. Some of us have more resources than others, but all of us have broken relationships, perhaps with God, with self, with others, or with God's creation as a whole, just life itself. And when I begin to understand that, I now realize there's no hierarchy I don't look at somebody who's poor and immediately think, oh, I wonder what I can do for them because I immediately see a hierarchical, patriarchical understanding that I am the have and you are the have not. How can I do something for you? But I understand that I am poor also. And rather than my first thought being, what can I do for you? I take them by the hand and say, I'm poor too. What can I do with you? Maybe as we walk this life thing together, we could figure something God-honoring out. Amen? So then, what is poverty alleviation? What is true Poverty alleviation. 
If this is poverty, then poverty alleviation must be the ministry of reconciliation. If ultimate biblical poverty is, hey, I've got to, I've got broken relationships all across the board, then poverty alleviation is the restoration or the reconciliation of those broken relationships to become as God intended them to be, which will have multiple impact and consequences over every other part of life. You see, I think when Jesus, if he were asked, wait a minute, Jesus, sometimes you say blessed are the poor, and then sometimes you say blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall have the kingdom of God. Which one is it? Blessed are the poor, materially poor, or blessed are the poor in spirit? I think Jesus would just look at us and say, yes. So moving people closer to glorifying God by living in right relationship with God, with self, with others, and the rest of creation, it's perfect. And I've got great news for you, or maybe God has great news for you. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, when you become a kingdom citizen, when you let go of the world and you take a hold of his kingdom, we move from darkness to light, Old things have passed away. All things become new. And this is from God, who through Christ did what? Reconciled himself to uh, us to himself. And the good news, how are we going to do these four things? He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Every kingdom citizen in this room has been given the ministry of reconciliation. Every single person in Knoxville has been given the ministry who are following Christ the King. Every person listening online who's following Christ the King and living in his kingdom have been given the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling their relationship with the Father, with themselves, with others, and with all of creation. Wow. If only we had a counseling center to really catalyze this. Praise God we do. When you understand this for what it really is, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And we are, by God's grace, allowed to participate in that ministry. And we are going to have a place out in the community where people who are poor, again, poverty runs the gamut, broken relationship with the Father, broken relationship with self, They have identity issues. Uh, I don't know who I am in Christ. Uh, They're going to have conflict with other people, maybe their own spouse, their family, friends, right? And the rest of life. That's what it is. And our ability to care about that, provide for that, pray for that, serve in that is going to be life-changing. We engage the community with this ministry of reconciliation. So we know what the kingdom is. We have to engage the kingdom, bringing life as it was meant to be, bringing heaven to earth. We know what the poor are, those who have uh, broken relationships in the four key areas of life, God, self, others, and relation. Now what do we do? We embrace service. I've got to engage. I've got to embrace. I've got to serve. I've got to play my part in this kingdom war, this kingdom ministry. Faith without works is dead. And although we are all poor in this biblical sense, it's clear that God has a special place in his heart for the materially poor, orphan, widow, and foreigners. As a matter of fact, there are over 2,000 verses in all of Scripture 
that the Bible mentions the poor, orphan, widow, and foreigner. More than heaven, more than hell, more than a lot of important topics that we talk about all the time are God's heart for the marginalized, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised of our community and the world. People who are not experiencing human flourishing, they're not experiencing the kingdom of God. And James mentions a few examples by basically saying if you see someone who, who does, who, they're poorly clothed and, or they don't have daily food and you say to them, hey, I'm a Christian and you don't have enough food, I'm going to pray for you. And they say, why don't you take your prayers and stuff them and give me some freaking food? <laughs> or if somebody's freezing and doesn't have a coat, and we say, you know, I'm going to pray you get a coat. James says, give them a coat, pray later. Good luck. Be well fed, be well clothed, praying for you. He says it does not have works. That faith is dead. You say, wait a minute. These are the people you see Jesus identifies with. We already read that. What are you doing for the kingdom? That's the question. What are you doing for the marginalized, the vulnerable, those who are not experiencing the kingdom or life or the abundant life as it was meant to be? They're experiencing brokenness in one of the four relational areas of life, or life is just food, poverty, educate, whatever it is. You say, what do you mean what I'm doing? I believe in Jesus. Well, that's awesome. Now you're in the category with the demons. Ooh, that was another punch from James, wasn't it? What to say in verse 20? Verse 19, oh, that's great. You believe in God? The demons believe that, and they're scared to death of him. In Matthew 11, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's coming to die. The next day, he's dying. The verdict could come down. Tomorrow, you're going to have your head cut off. John had been given everything he could to this kingdom, to this king, his own cousin. And one of John's last requests was to send a messenger to Jesus and ask him this question, are you the one? Are you the one who is to come or is there another? And I get it. John's 33 years old. He's not gonna have a full life, at least in age. And he's going to die for this kingdom and this king. And he sends this request, sends this guy to go talk to Jesus. He says, Jesus, are you the one? You see, I think John wants to know, I've given my life to this. I just want to know if my life matters. Was there any purpose to this? I was eating bugs in the desert. I didn't have a home. I never got married. I'm going to die at 33. I just need to know, does my life matter? Are you the one? Or was this whole thing just a myth, a fantasy? And Jesus sends back to John. He doesn't say, tell John, I was born of a virgin. I never sinned. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to raise from the dead. You're okay. No. What does Jesus say? Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus says, look at what I'm doing. And I think John went, he got it. It mattered. It mattered. He gave him his good deeds. You see, good news... <laughs> Good deeds provide goodwill so that we can share the good news. The lack of kingdom service in communist Russia crippled the church when the government took them over. I would say it has crippled the church in America. Christians used to build in the 1800s, early 1900s, 
If you look at many of the things that we have even to this day, Christians were building schools. They were building hospitals, orphanages. They cared for the poor and the widows. Somewhere along the way, the government took many of those things over. And when you don't care for the broken and the hurting and the lost, the least, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the people that Jesus identifies himself with, something bad happens in your community. We begin to focus upon ourselves. I heard a great man say about 15 years ago, it's, it's not same-sex marriage or abortion that will take down American Christianity. It is materialism. Our children are being raised to be consumers, which is counterculture to Jesus calling us to be givers. And it's happened. And you say, well, that's no big deal, right? I mean, what's... At least I'm not a murderer. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Does anybody know why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed? How many of you have heard that Sodom and Gomorrah were, were destroyed because of sexual sins or homosexuality? Anybody ever hear that? N nobody's heard that? Oh my gosh, please raise your hand. I want to see. I look around. You've heard that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. I mean, my gosh, of course it is, for goodness sake. I mean, we get the definition of sodomy from Sodom. Now, that, that, that's, that's a great lesson unless you actually read your Bible. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, God tells the prophet Ezekiel, as he's proclaiming about Jerusalem, he says, this is the sin of your sister Sodom. So he's making a reference to Sodom being the sister of Jerusalem, and this is going to happen to you if you don't get it together and start following God. This is what happened to your sister Sodom. Good, I've been wondering what the sin was. Homosexuality and sexual sins, right? She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the... What? I never heard that sermon. Where are the homosexuals? Where are the... Sexual perversion. Oh, it's coming. It's in verse 50. What is God trying to teach us through Ezekiel? They began to focus upon themselves. They began to focus upon themselves. I'm God. I'm the issue. I'm the team on the field. They became arrogant, proud, overfed. Help us, Lord. Who, what country are we talking about? Sodom. Sodom. Right. Sodom. No other country. Sodom. And they became unconcerned and they did not help the poor and the needy. You see, once you take your focus off of other people, you stop serving other people. You stop reading verses like, consider others better than yourself. Love your neighbor. Once you lose that, there's only one other person to focus on, yourself. And guess what goes up when you start focusing on yourself? Anxiety. I wonder if anxiety is an issue in our society at all, or fear, or concern about things. Yeah, because when you sit around and regurgitate and recycle thoughts in your own head about what I have or don't have or how people are treating me and this and that, your anxiety increases. One of the best mental health things I could ever give anybody would be this, serve other people. I just saved you $100 an hour. You can make it check out too, talk. No. <laughs> Serve other people. Teach uneducated poor to be educated. Bring the kingdom to earth. 
care for the poor, the orphan, the widow. Yes. Let me close with this. You take service away from the church, the church becomes powerless. There was a day, let me use a a golf metaphor today since it's Holy Masters weekend, right? (laughs) There was a day when we were all on the green. We were all on the green. We say it's some of the basic values. We had Judeo-Christian values. Even if you weren't a Christian, you kind of had this belief, work hard, take care of your family. Like there was some basic stuff. So, some of you are my age. Or you remember those days, right? That basically we were all on the, on the green. And, and to, to get them to kingdom life or to get them to the king or talk about Jesus, all you needed was a putter. I mean, we just had to, we just had to tap them in. Tap them in. We're all on the green, by the way. Hey, do you know Jesus? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. Well, pray a prayer of faith in Jesus. Tap him in. Just tap him in. We're all on the green. You know Jesus? No, not really. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God for the wages of sin is death and though the gift of eternal life is Jesus Christ. I want to know Jesus. Amen. Tap him in. That day is over. We're not all on the same green anymore. I I hope that's not breaking news. You've got the green. And then you've got people all the way, about 600 yards away on about a par, par 10. No such thing. And you're going to need multiple clubs to get people to the green. Before you can tap them in. You understand what I'm saying? We need a driver. We might need a three wood and a seven iron and a wedge and then a, what, what's the driver? What's the three wood? What's the seven iron? What's the wedge? I, I tell you what I think it is. It's service. It's loving your neighbor. And as I love my neighbor, ah, I'm moving them a little closer to the what? To the green. Now somewhere in here, maybe we can start having a spiritual conversation. Oh, I'm in the sand. I'm in trouble. This is a nightmare. Just whack at it or move it out. You know, we won't look. We just got to move people. How did Jesus move people? Oh, he had an amazing teaching. My goodness, he loved people well. He healed. He prayed. He fed. He loved children. You know what I'm saying? And I think the way we can get it back as a church, the way we can begin to evangelize our evangelistic fervor, what would it come from? I think it comes from our demonstration of the gospel as well as our proclamation of the gospel. And as we love our neighbors, we move them closer to the green. So that at the end of all this, we want to hear what? We want to hear well done. I think some people think Christianity is about knowledge, you know, knowing something. And we're gonna hear well known, well attended. No, 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 no. Don't miss this. The kingdom life is about what you're doing. You're not saved by doing it, but your works are evidence of your faith. Well done. Well done. We're either going to hear it or depart from me. Father, we love you and bless you. We thank you for this kingdom life. We thank you for being our king. Lord Jesus, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, Lord, let your light shine, be salt, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. 
Let this be what we're all about. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.